As I told you last week, when we look at the book of Romans and we see what Paul is saying, Paul is speaking to different people, almost like you imagine a round table. And sometimes he's speaking to a person who's not a, a believer in Jesus Christ at all. He's a Greek and he has a, 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 an idolatrous view of the world or he has a moralistic view of the world. And then at other times he's speaking to a, a devout Jew who is also not a believer in Jesus as the Messiah. And he has a kind of a, a legalistic religious worldview. And, that, and then at times... Paul pivots and he's speaking to a Gentile believer or he's speaking to a Jewish believer. They're all at the table. And in this section in Romans chapter 6 where we're looking at, Paul is speaking to people who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He's speaking to Greek believers and he's writing to Jewish believers and he's engaging them in 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 a study of what it is that Christ has done for them and how their lives have changed. Now, if you're not a believer... This will sound really strange to you. This will not necessarily make sense. You're going to be on the outside looking in. Uh, Those other individuals that are sitting at the table are listening to this conversation, and they're hearing about something that they have not experienced themselves. But it's important that you know what Paul says is the genuine, real experience of the person who has put faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And this is what we're reading about about primarily in Romans chapter 6 and also in Romans chapter 7. Let me read to you this morning for verses 5 through 11 of Romans chapter 6, and then we'll pray together briefly. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And that phrase, the body of sin would be done away with, means that it should be nullified or it should lose its power, its impulse, its effect. Four, in verse seven, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also. Now you can imagine Paul looking at and considering and addressing directly these ones who profess faith in Jesus Christ. You also reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, when we're looking at this passage and you read different commentators and, you know, I counted up the books that I have on the on the book of Romans and I've got well over 20 of them. And there are various there are different individuals who are chiming in on what these what is the primary thrust of what Paul is talking about here. And it's kind of equally divided. Some people think that what Paul is talking about here is he's just talking about the work that Jesus did on the cross to make us right with God in order to justify us, to to take away our sins and cleanse us and forgive us so that uh, they could be all paid for and we could now proceed forward in a right relationship with God. And so that, that's where they would say that uh, Paul is teaching. Others, about the same a number, would say, no, actually Paul is pivoted here, and this is what I believe. Paul is pivoted here to really begin addressing uh, the life of holiness, the sanctified life. That is what, what God wants to make of us, where God wants to lead us. After we've saved, he's set us apart so that we could live for him and we could live through him, his power, his impulse, his life, a holy life, a sanctified, that's what it means to be sanctified. And so really what the theme is here is Paul's talking about sanctification. In a sense, actually, the, these are two things. They're, they're not two things. They're one thing, but they're extension of one thing. San- our justification being made right with God leads us into a, a, a relationship with God in which God produces through us holiness and sanctification and they go together. And so one individual by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse, which, who was a famous preacher about uh, 80 years ago, said that holiness starts where justification finishes. And if holiness doesn't start in an individual's life, we may have a right to suspect that justification never started either. In other words, if you've really been justified, believed in Jesus Christ, and you've received Him, and you're right with God, it's going to change the way you live and what your future is going to be like and what's produced out of your life and that holiness is going to take place. In a sense, there's a middle thing they're missing here, and I think this is really where this passage is addressing. They're missing that at the cross, the Lord Jesus did two things to save us. 
One was a transactional thing. That is that the sinless son of God transacted to take all of our sins and the punishment of all of our sins on himself and he paid for it with his perfect righteousness and through his suffering in order that in the place of our sins he might give to us a covering or an accounting of all of God's righteousness so that when God looks at us who believed in him, he sees that our sins are all paid for. He not only sees that our sins are all paid for, but that to our account now, you might say, is the account of all the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why we say Jesus died for our sins. He died for my sins. He took the punishment of my sins. That's a a transaction that took place in the cross. But there's another thing that takes place. That's what makes for justification, being made right with God. But there's another thing that Jesus did on the cross. He made it possible at the cross for me to become, who put my faith in him, a completely new person. He he did a work that opened up a pathway for something transformational, not just something transactional. And that is where I'm transformed. Because I believe in him, and I trust in him, and I, I put my faith in him. The Bible says I'm born again of the Spirit of God. I receive a new life and I believe this portion of scripture is talking about the new life, the regenerate life. It's called regeneration. The new life that is brought to us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And that new life actually begins, it's initiated in the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ died. And that is what Paul is talking about here. And so we're going to be talking about things we talked about last week. And we're probably going to talk about this for some weeks ahead when I'm able to come back and speak with you. Uh, Because Paul doesn't just say this once. He he says this over and over and over again because it's such a tremendous truth. And yet at the same time, it's kind of hard to accept that it's true. When you look at your life sometimes and you see the way you behave sometimes, you wake up in the morning. You know, you can go in the morning in a perfectly good mood and you can wake up in the morning and you don't even know why, but you're in a foul mood, right? You can go to bed with a woman who loves you and you can wake up and she's, you don't want to go near her if she has a frying pan in her hand. So this happens sometimes. And so as a result, you have a hard time. Well, how does this regeneration thing work? And well, Paul's going to explain this over and over again so that we understand it. But let's go back and consider some things that we've talked about here. And the first thing I want you to see is that at the moment that an individual puts saving faith in Jesus Christ, that individual is planted into the death of Jesus Christ, and so in turn they are brought into the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. That's what Romans 6 is talking about. Romans 6 is actually describing and then presuming upon a miracle that happens to us at salvation. It was something, it's something so wonderful that it's hard to fully understand, but in the moment and hour in which I put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, my old spirit that old man who was bound in sin and under its condemnation and basically living out a pattern of selfishness and a pattern that was taking him away from the will of God, that old man was put to death. It's as if God took at that moment that I believed in him, my old spirit, who I am in my essence, and he drew me back 2,000 years ago and he put me into the death of Jesus Christ. And I died with Christ in that moment. And so what do we read here? Paul says we have been united. That means we've been planted or linked up together in Jesus Christ in the likeness of his death. That's in verse 5. See there in verse 6 he says, our old man. Now remember, he's speaking to the born again individual, the person who's put his faith in Jesus Christ. He says, our old man. He says, your old man was crucified with him. You can see in verse 8 he says, we died with Christ. And we've actually read that before in verse 2 as well. It says, how shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? We've died. It's happened. It's taken place. And so in that moment, which I gave my life to Jesus Christ, the old man was put to death. And in that moment, a new spiritual man or a new spiritual woman is created and raised in the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. That's what's being talked about here. Five and eight. Look at verses five and eight for a second. There, it puts the death in the past. It's something that happened. It's there with Christ in his death upon the cross. But then it appears that he puts the resurrection life into the future. Verse 5, it says, that we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 8 says this, 
Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And so we might look at that passage and say, okay, what Paul's talking about is he's talking about two historical moments way back in the past. In some wonderful way, I died with Christ in the past, past on the cross where Jesus died. By the way, a real actual death, an agonizing death, a death that put him into a tomb and they laid the spices over him in death. And I was in that death. And now it's also saying that in the future, I'm going to be with Christ in the resurrection. He's going to return. And one day he's going to call me forth. I might die before he comes back again. But the Bible is saying that when I die, my spirit will go with the presence of the Lord Jesus. And then when he returns to the earth one day, he's going to raise my body as a glory, glorified body. And I'm going to be united back with that body in a glorified way. And I'll be forever with the Lord, enjoying the resurrection life with him forever and ever, and how wonderful that will be, and that's going to be real too. I mean, that's going to be something that you experience. That's not a theory, uh, some arethral dream, but it's going to be a ra- reality that's going to take place. So you can look at the past, okay, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about that reality of something, somehow I died in the past, and somehow I know, well, I know this, I'm going to live with him someday forever in the future, and I'm going to be with him forever. But now look at verse 11, because verse 11 would indicate to us that this reference to the resurrection that's been made in verses 5 and verse 8 is not to the resurrection we'll someday experience when the Lord Jesus returns, but it's actually a reference to the resurrected impulse of life that we're to experience as followers of Jesus Christ right now in this moment at this time. So here's what it says in verse 11. Paul says, likewise, reckon. The word reckon there just means do the math, add it up, count it up, count it as a fact. Consider it a fact that you yourselves are dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the believer, in a sense, the resurrection has already come. I, when I trust and believe in Jesus Christ at that moment, I come in contact with the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, and I I have that life. Actually, here's what happens. This is what Paul is saying. At the moment that I put my faith in Jesus Christ to be my Savior, I first came in contact with His death and all that I was and all that was driving me in my sin and in my selfishness, my own pursuits. All that man died at that moment, and then... In that death, there was a flash of life, and I began to live in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And these were combined together. My death, my life comes through Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul's talking about. This is something that, in a sense, we have to get our minds around. But it's this idea that the person who believes in Jesus Christ counts the old things he was as completely dead, and the new thing he is has been given to him through Jesus Christ alone. Go back and I want to just explain this a little bit more to you and try to help you understand this. When Jesus died on the cross for your sins, paying the transaction for your sins, he was completely alone on the cross. He was dying in your place. You were not there. Your sins were there, placing upon him, bringing him into suffering and misery, and he bore the hell you deserve alone on the cross for your sins. He was all by himself dying on the cross, and and then when he had finished paying the price of your sins, he cried out from the cross, it's finished. The payment's made. And he did that all by himself for you. But then something mysterious took place. After he did that, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then the Bible says he gave up the ghost, which means he died. Now here's what this passage is saying. Somehow, in some mysterious way, At that moment, I was connected to Christ. At that moment, he was not just bearing my sins, but I was put into his death. And what I was and what I couldn't stop being and what was controlling my nature and my life and and driving me into sin and bound to sin was put into him. So that when he went to the grave, I went into the grave with him and I died. In order that I might live and have a new life that would rise up within me that he would give me of himself so that when he rose again, He would give me his life and I'd rise with him and I'd be alive with a new life. And that's what, that's what the regenerate life is. That's what regeneration is. That's what's being taught with us here. I want you to see something else here. This is the second point here. This is an incredible and immense mystery. 
The mystery is not simply that I died to my old man or that my old man died in Christ. The mystery isn't somehow how mysteriously I was united with him in that death. The mystery isn't how that as a result I've been set free from the bondage that I was in to my sin and my selfishness so that I could live now to him and his resurrection power. All that's wonderful, all that's true, but the, the greatest mystery of this passage we've read is that it speaks of Christ's death. It speaks of the dominion of death over him. It speaks of the fact that Christ himself died to sin. Look at verses 9b and 10. So the last half of verse 9 and then verse 10. And I will just tell you that this may be one of the most mysterious texts in all of Scripture. There it says this. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's speaking of Jesus Christ. (laughs) This is the Son of God. This is the one who was the Word and was in the beginning with God and was God and that all things were created by Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. This is the triune God who became a man and lived a perfect and sinless life and yet it says that death for a moment had dominion over Him. But it no longer does. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died the word here is to sin or unto sin once for all, but the life he lives, to live to God, he lives to God. And what these words mean is that at least for some moment in the life of Christ, death had dominion over him, and that at some point in time in the life of the Lord Jesus, he was with sin or before sin, and he had to die to sin. He had to die to sin. And well, that's, to me, hard to understand. I have a hard time grasping. I understand how Jesus could die for my sins. The sinless Lamb of God and Son of God would take upon Himself what did not belong to Him, my sin, and He could suffer for my sins. I can understand that. But I don't exactly understand how it is that the sinless Son of God had any relationship with sin whatsoever so that He had to die to it. He had to somehow be severed from it because it had a a claim upon Him. But this is what this passage is saying to us. This is what this passage is communicating to us. This first says that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, died to sin or in relationship to sin so that he may live to God. And the question I have to ask is, in, in what way did Christ die to sin so that he can now live to God? And I think the answer is this. This can only be said because Jesus Christ at the cross, as he gave himself up to death, took upon himself my sin and my old nature, my old man, and he sunk me into himself. And in that moment, because of who I was and what I was, he was brought into a relationship with sin that I've had to struggle with before I met him all my life. Maybe you still struggle with now. He was brought into the relationship of my temptations and my struggles and my sins in order that he might lead me in my old man to be dead to that sin in order that in its place he might give me his life, his overcoming life that I might live in his power and his life. So look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. We quote this passage a lot. There are passages in Scripture that you realize you have to come back to again and again because they're like these windows through which you begin to understand all of God's revealed word and the plan that God had for us. And this is one of those passages. There it says of the Lord Jesus Christ that, speaking of God the Father, He made Him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now, I read that passage and I say, okay, there's justification. Jesus bore my sins in my place in order that He might cover me with God's righteousness in an exchange, in a transaction. But if I read this again, I also see there's a transformation here. He had sin brought into Himself in order that the righteousness of God through Him might be brought into me. And I might have His righteous life living and abiding and expressing itself within me. Jesus Christ, the sinless, perfect Son of God, became sin for us. And here's what we can conclude. Not that we'll ever entirely be able to understand this mystery. Death could never have come near the Son of God, but that He took into Himself ourselves, us and our old sinful natures, us who were bound to sin, 
sin had no approximation to the Holy One of God, but that He, beyond taking sin upon Himself as a penalty, He took you and me upon Himself. The fallen, corrupted, caught in the web of sin, you and me, He took us into Himself. And on the cross, the Lord Jesus assumed our sins. And because the Lord Jesus assumed our sins on the cross, death and sin for a moment put a claim upon Him, the Savior. The same claim that has been upon you. If you're unsaved, it's the same claim that's on your life right now. If you've given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the claim that was on your life up to the day that you believed and trusted in Him. A claim that manipulated and maneuvered you and brought you under bondage and under control and opened up a pathway for the, the immaterial part of your life to be, in a sense, bound in a relationship with sin that you couldn't break free from. The Lord Jesus entered into all those things for a moment when He took us into Himself, and then Jesus died to it all. He buried us, and that old man in His death, in order that we might live in His regenerate power and His resurrection power, and all we can say is it's mystery. It's His mystery all that the Son of God is no longer under the dominion of sin, and so we are no longer under the dominion of sin. And the Son of God is no longer, He is dead to sin because He died to our sin and died to the assumption that He, he had received of Himself and of Himself to sin. And so we who trust in Him are no longer, we are dead to sin as well. We're no longer bound to it, no longer in relationship with it. We um, talked about this last week. We use some examples from Scripture. The Bible talks about a, a woman who's married to a man, and if the man dies, she's no longer bound to him. And we, we use this as an illustration to say, in a sense, that we might think, you know, because we die to sin, that we're no longer in relationship to, we're no longer in relationship to sin. In this case, it's as if sin is the husband, and the wife is the one who's bound to him, and we're so kind of woven into, uh, into the commitment of selfishness and sin. We don't know where our inner self, our, our deep, the deep core of who we are, that immaterial part of us that in a sense is behind the keys that's coordinating all the DNA and everything that we are physically. That inner self is so bound and wed to sin that we don't know where selfishness and sin ends and where we begin or where we end and sin begins. It's all tied together. It's as if we become one in a almost like a matrimonial relationship with this compromised state. And that's the old man. That's what the Bible is describing as the old man. And then when I come to Jesus Christ, it's not sin that dies. We can see that right now. It's all around us. But the person who was wed to sin, us like the wife, we die. We don't have a relationship to sin anyway in that way anymore. We're dead to it. We die to it. And a, and a new spirit, a new life is given to us through the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. So the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. That's what you say when someone dies, by the way. You know, John passed away last week. The old has passed away and everything has become new. We're new in Christ. We're new creatures in him. And that means when temptation and sin comes knocking at my door and says, and you know, has the key, pretends that he has a key to my house and my life and says, he's going to claim me and I have a relationship with him and he's beckoning me to come and yield myself back to his favors. I can say, I, you're knocking at the wrong door because who you're looking for doesn't live here anymore. Dead to you. Not wed to you anymore. My spirit has been bound up in Jesus Christ and I live through his power and through his life and I'm a new creation. That's kind of what's being talked about here. And that's what Christ accomplished for me mysteriously when he brought me into his own death and put me to death in order that he might bring me into his resurrection and bring me into life. Now listen, sounds kind of strange, hard to get your brains around, hard to accept. It's true. It's Christ, what Christ has done for us. Let me make one brief application. I've got about three pages on this application, so we're not going to read all three pages. It's going to be brief, I promise you. Regeneration, being born again, means that you're not what you were. You're something new and different. It actually means that there's a clear distinction between the person who's been born again and the person who's not been born again. The person who's put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior and the person who's not been put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's not something that church has emphasized very much because we've kind of wanted to say to people, we want to relate to people by being able to say, you know, come on, join us. We're no different than you are. But the problem is if, if you can say you're no different than anyone else who's not a believer in Jesus Christ, who hasn't committed their life to Jesus Christ, the only way that could be true is if you're not a believer yourself. 
if, if you've not come to Jesus Christ and received him, because this passage is saying it's not true. I'm a new man. The old man I am is, is dead. Now, what I can say to someone is, been there. Know what you're going through. Know the experience. Know the captivity. Know the loneliness. Know the sense of alienation. Know the pattern of trying to over and again achieve and gain and sliding back again. Know it. Know the defilement. Know it. Was there. Know exactly what you're going through. But I'm not there any longer. Somehow, wonderfully, that died in me some time ago. A new man is given to me, a new life, a new being lives and abides with me. And oh, I, I still struggle in certain ways, but I, I struggle from a different vantage point. I'm on a different hill altogether. I've got a, a totally different walk that's going on. That's the answer. That's the thing we have to say. What's being described here is not the outcome of turning over a new leaf. It's not the outcome of deciding that you're going to be a better person or develop some good habits. It's not even the outcome of getting back to God and finding a religion. It's not a, a portrait of a reformed person, but it's a, a new thing that is broken into the world that wasn't there before, a regenerate person, a new thing that's broken into your own body that wasn't there before, a new life, a new spirit that comes from Jesus Christ. It's not a person who's gone through some religious translations of themselves in order to find some new way to write out their life and their belief system. It's someone who's experienced a profound spiritual transformation and they've been made new. They've been made new. Well, we're going to have to talk about this again and again. Did you see that? I just threw like pages. They're just, I'm just <laughs> shuffling them over here. We'll give us some content for, for what we want to talk about later. But... It brings us to what the application here is for the believer and the one who's given their life to Christ. The application is in verse 11. Likewise you also reckon, consider the fact that you're dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think it's good to know and to point out that Christians can sin. And it's good to know that we need to confess those sins and bring them before the Lord who finds His cleansing and His righteousness. But we must begin to make these confessions. But I think it's also important that we exercise ourselves and consider and reckon that the Bible teaches us that in Christ we're no longer sinners. That's not our identity. We're not just sinners. We're not just like everyone else. Not, if, it, if you could say that it's true, there's something essentially wrong in your walk with Jesus Christ and your knowledge of Him. The fact is this passage is teaching us that we're something completely new. The Bible actually refers to us and identifies us this way. To the saints in Ephesus. <laughs> to the saints in Philippi. To the saints in Colossae. To the saints you know what? To the holy ones, to the ones who have this whole new life, the sanctified life. And this is an identity that we need to, in a sense, submerse our thinking and our minds and our consideration in as we walk through every pathway in life and as we engage all the different things that are all around us in the world in which we live. We are regenerate souls with the mind of Christ and the righteousness of Christ not only covering us, but abiding within us. We are cleansed and purified individuals who have a new spirit that has been brought into approximation with the spirit of God himself. So that we might, through Jesus Christ, live out a righteousness that would give honor to him. Here's a reason why you need to separate yourselves from the things of the world. You're not of it. Here's a reason why you shouldn't be too engaged in fellowshipping and pursuing the things of this world because, well, they're not for you. They're not the things of the life that God has given you. I'll remind you of a proverb that's found in Proverbs 31 where the proverb begins with this. A mother is speaking to her son who's a prince. And the mother says, what my son? And what the son of my womb? And what the son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings, for it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink. And what's being called here is this. Live like royalty. 
Live like what you've been made and what you are. So how is the regenerate person supposed to live? He's supposed to live like a person who has the King of Kings and Lord of Lords living within them and in their hearts in deep, life-changing relationship. Living and expressing Himself at the core of their being. Living holy as He is holy because He lives in us. It's possible because He's changed us. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, ah, what a mystery. Almost a boast we don't want to make. It sounds proud. It strikes with a lack of humility. And on some occasions, it doesn't even sound real. But if it's true that we believed in you and put our faith in you, and all of our hope and trust is in what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross. It's true that He not only died to take away my sins, but He died there in order to take me away and give me a new life and make me a new person. And if it's true that Jesus Christ has indeed died, then this has to be true. I, who have believed in You, have died as well. And if it's true that one day He's coming back to raise me from the dead in order that I might live forever with Him, that now He's giving me that resurrection life, then I have that life. It's true. It's true. Forgive me, O God, for choosing to live by falsehoods instead of by what You have declared to be true. Anchor me. Set me down on the foundation of a new life. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who doesn't have that as a foundation that today they would leave this place knowing they believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, knowing that He's sufficient to take away all their sins, but knowing even more that He's sufficient to give them a brand new, completely new life in Him. That they just receive that from you by faith. Let you begin building a new life for them through your grace and your mercy. I praise you, dear God, for the things we're considering and for what we need to consider over and over again. We'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.